tell you a story. I found it on my A priest, an evangelist, and a minister were in a rowboat in the middle of a pond fishing. None of them had caught anything all morning. Sounds biblical, doesn't it? <laughs> then the evangelist stands up and says he needs to go to the bathroom. So he climbs out of the boat. He walks on the water to the shore. He comes back ten minutes later the same way. Then the minister decides that he needs to go to the bathroom, too. So he climbs out of the boat and walks on the water to shore. He, too, comes back the same way ten minutes later. The priest looks at both and decides, my faith is just as strong as their faith just as strong as my fishing buddies. And he thought, I can walk on water too. He stands up, excuses himself. As he steps out of the boat, he makes this big splash down into the water. And the evangelist looks at the minister and says, I suppose we should have told him where the rocks were. <laughs> oh, well. So let us... Let us pray together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you're a mighty God, the Holy One of Israel. And Jesus, we want to enter into an experience of your love and presence today through the power of your word. Because when we hear your word, it is alive, it is active, and we are transformed by it. We are renewed, we are lifted up, and we're edified and encouraged and affirmed by the power of your love, Lord Jesus. We are transformed. And so we thank you for this day, for this lesson about the nativity of Jesus and how Jesus came into this world for our sakes, Lord. Thank you so much, Jesus, and please allow us to um, be able to receive your word, Lord, not so much what I would say, but your word spoken to our hearts, Lord. Transform us, renew us, and I pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so uh, today, our lesson, uh, we are on the birth of Jesus and the presentation of Jesus. Those are the two things that we'll cover today. And I want to begin with, uh, if you would look at, or you could listen, uh, to this Gospel of John. Remember this scripture. Uh, you've seen it held up at football games, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So we need to know the power of that in our lives. Uh, God so loved the world. And then the Gospel of John says also, uh, to as many as received him, he gave power to become children of God. To as many as believed in his name. And so this first chapter in the Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Word, who was Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things came to be. Not one thing had its being, but through him. All that came to be had life in him, and that life was the light of men, a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness could not overpower, and that Word became flesh to dwell among us. And we saw his glory, the glory that is his as the only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And to all who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God to all who believe in his name. Amen. Amen. So now we have to begin there because we have to know who Jesus is. Who was this who entered into the world, into space and time? And invited all of us. That's the key to this uh, lesson. Jesus came into this world for all of us. All of us are invited into the family of God. There is no exclusion of anyone. And so we know from Luke's uh, setting of the birth of Jesus into the history of the whole world, it is his way of saying Jesus came for everyone. Everyone has the opportunity to believe and receive Jesus as Lord. How do we do that? Do we know how to do it? When I grew up, nobody told me that I needed to uh, believe in Jesus so as to receive Jesus. I didn't know that. I knew that I believed in Jesus. I had faith in him. I was told all about him. But nobody told me that I needed to receive him, that there was going to be power, and I would have that power if I would receive Jesus. How do we do that? We simply say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
I believe that God sent him into this world that I might have salvation. And now I want to receive him. And so let us pray, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I want to invite you into my heart today. I want to invite you into my heart today. In a new way. In a new way. Dispel all the darkness within me. Dispel all the darkness within me. And fill me with your presence. And fill me with your presence. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you. Everyone has that opportunity to believe that God sent his only begotten son. And everybody has the opportunity to receive. <clears throat> Our part is to tell people about it. Our part is to tell people about Jesus. Uh, we know from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians that everything that God said through the prophets would be fulfilled at God's appointed time. So Galatians 4, 4 <coughs> says this, When the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, to enable us to be adopted as children. The proof that you are children is that God has sent the Holy Spirit of his Son, into our hearts. And the Holy Spirit in us cries out, Abba, Father. In other words, we know that we are God's children. I hope uh, that you read from the Catechism uh, what we must do now to enter into the family of God. We must be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There was a time in my life that I discovered when I was an adult that my daddy was not baptized. And I was really scared because, of course, I believed what the church teaches and that what Jesus said. You must be born again through water and the Spirit. So I wanted my daddy to go to heaven. I knew he believed, but he had not satisfied the requirements that Jesus had set before us. Now, the church teaches that there are three forms of baptism. The first that we know of quite well baptism of water by the bishop, priest, or deacon, and then there is the baptism in the blood by which the martyrs were baptized, and then there is the baptism of desire, the person who believes and desires baptism but has been unable to be baptized. The church tells us that God honors that. I think it was Blessed or uh, Kateri Tekwitha who has never been able to be baptized, and she so desired it. So the Lord honors that. Mm -hmm. Well, our church teaches that even, and I learned this as a little girl, that even children, if someone is in danger of death, even a child may use water and baptize uh, in the Trinitarian formula. That formula is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, since my daddy was not uh, yet baptized, I began carrying around holy water with me. Because <laughs> I thought, just in case there's an emergency and he needed to be baptized, I could baptize him really quickly. And uh, he was eventually baptized when my mom and my daddy were married for 40 years. So I didn't have to baptize him. <laughs> but anyway, so let's talk about Jesus. What was required by the law and how his birth came about? We know this story so well. So this is how it came about. In Luke 2, 1 through 20, it says this. Now at this time, Caesar Augustus issued a decree for a census of the whole world to be taken. This census, the first, took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to be registered. So Joseph set out from the town of Nazareth in Galilee and traveled up to Judea, to the town of David, called Bethlehem, since he was of David's house and line, in order to be registered together with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to have her child, and she gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the end. In the countryside, their flocks, the shepherds were watching their flocks and they lived in the fields and they took it in turns to watch their flocks during the night. Well, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and then the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said, do not be afraid, listen. I bring you news of great joy, a joy to be shared by the whole people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. And here's a sign for you. 
you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly with the angel there was a great throng of the heavenly host praising God and singing, Glory to God in the highest and peace to men who enjoy his favor. So now when the angels left, they were amazed. First of all, Joseph took Mary from Nazareth to Judea to the town of David called Bethlehem. So they could register in the first census that they were taken. It was going to be a census of the whole world. Isn't it amazing how God sets everything up? He knew beforehand and prophesied where Jesus, the Messiah, his only begotten son, would be born. God prophesied this through the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. He said, but as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. For you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. Now the scriptures are a living word. Luke 2.11 says, Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. This is still good news. It is fresh news for everyone who has never heard it. There may be people that you know even that have never heard this message. A Savior has been born for you. A baby. Isn't that sweet? A baby. He came to give us life, to save us from eternal death and give us eternal life. I would like to read my uh, answer, A, on page 8, to just a very short response. What is the birth? of this child born over 2,000 years ago mean to me today. In faith, I believe in this historical event, when and where the Messiah, the Christ, was born. I believe he is my Savior. I believe he is my Lord, and that through him I have eternal life. God did not make things difficult for us to understand, but came to us in humility, that we might not be terrified by our holy God, but instead desire to embrace him as a baby and come to love him and hold him to our hearts <coughs> as we would a baby. So God made it easy for us, didn't he? It's easy to learn to love a baby. Now the angel of the Lord announced this good news to the shepherds in the field. The loneliest occupation there was in that day and time, they were poor, nomads, tending sheep in the countryside, and yet God shows his universal love to everyone by sending angels to announce the good news to those who were considered the least worthy. Well, when the good news was announced, suddenly, our scripture said there was a great throng of the heavenly hosts praising God and singing, glory to God in the highest and peace to men of goodwill. The shepherds, of course, talked among themselves and said in chapter 2, verse 15, I want to read it. When the angels had gone from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried away and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw the child, they repeated what they had been told about him. And everyone who heard it was astonished at what the shepherds had to say. As for Mary, she treasured and pondered all things in her heart. So they found Mary and Joseph, and they found the baby Jesus lying in a manger. They began to tell everyone what they'd seen and heard. I think it's so interesting that a manger is a word for the feeding trough and that Bethlehem means the house of David. This was a foreshadowing which would be fulfilled in Jesus and in his public ministry. He said, I am the living bread come down from heaven. And by Jesus being laid in the manger, John 6, 51 is where it says, I am the living bread. And also this place where animals were fed <coughs> was a symbol and a sign that he himself would become our food. Mm -hmm. And so he is. Mar Mary, there's not a lot of words from her. She probably didn't know what to say, but she treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. <clears throat> when the eighth day came, um, Jesus was circumcised, and he was given the name Jesus. 
as the angel Gabriel said he would be called before his conception. This was the visible mark of the covenant God made with Abraham. Now our covenant is through the waters of baptism because of what Jesus said, you must be born again through water and the Spirit. And we receive the Holy Spirit through the waters of baptism. And then we're given uh, this unseen, indelible mark on us, on our foreheads. As a matter of fact, um, this, this indelible mark, uh, we cannot see it, but the uh, unseen realities can see we're marked. We belong to Jesus. And so this is given to us when we who have circumcised our hearts uh, enter into that relationship with Jesus through the waters of baptism. Now our parents do that for us and then raise, up, raise us up in the face. But this indelible mark is called the Dominicus character. There is a priest that I do not know him personally, but I know Bernadette has met him, and that is Father Sudox in Croatia. And he at one time had, uh, was given this and still wears this mark, a visible Dominicus character. Uh, and then later, after a year or so, he also received the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. But this, this particular uh, story is that he, he had, um, I heard his uh, testimony on YouTube sharing this. And uh, what he said was he had uh, been at a youth meeting and was going to have dinner with the family afterwards. And so he was, while they were preparing things, he went out on the patio and he was walking back and forth. He said, all of a sudden he, he said, I don't know what happened. He said, but I reached up and wiped my forehead. There was something on my forehead. And he wiped his forehead and he looked and it was blood. And he thought, did I cut myself with the overhang? And so he went into the bathroom and he looked and there was this cross on his forehead bleeding. And, uh, he reported himself to the bishop. They sent him to Rome, to the Balliol Hospital, I think that's the name of it, and uh, kept him um, there um, in a room by himself with a video camera to make sure this wasn't something that he had done to himself. Mm -hmm. And um, then they took him into a surgery. Uh, they put him to sleep, took him into surgery, and they cut around this to see if they could test it. What is this? And uh, the, what they removed, uh, the, the skin removed, was still alive skin. It didn't die, apparently. Um, so this, they knew, was from the Lord. They, they were testing that to see the Vatican wanted to know, is this the Lord or not? And so they had him put a Band-Aid over it when he's in public. So that it, because they don't want it to be spectacular. They don't want people just to see that. They want people to come to Jesus. And so, of course, you know, all of us want to see that sign, right? <laughs> so anyway, at one time I made a little prayer card for us of a picture of him with the Dominicus character uh, visible. But anyway, um, this is this visible uh, Dominicus character is on Father Sudouts where we can see it, but we cannot see it on ourselves. But through the waters of baptism, we receive this. So, so we are marked for Jesus also, not by circumcision, but by the Dominicus character through the waters of baptism. And as you know, through the waters of baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit, and we receive are infused with the three theological gifts of faith, hope, and love. Anyway, I, I thought that um, this was an interesting thought too in our lesson. After 33 more days after Jesus was circumcised, uh, it became 40 days after his birth, the day came when he would be presented at the temple and Mary would be purified as was pre prescribed under the law. Well, I found the scriptures in our lesson really interesting in that they spelled out exactly what they were to do. And Joseph and Mary were obedient to it all. And that's what's really wonderful is that, wow, their obedience was just immediate. They brought uh, to the temple, they brought two turtle doves for sacrifice, and in this way, the firstborn male must be consecrated to God, and that would redeem him. This rite was a sign of redemption, and that the two doves were offered as a sign of reparation. And so um, they came to the temple, they encountered uh, Simeon. Now, I just want to say Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He completed all the requirements of the law. 
And that was one of them. He said in Matthew 5, 17, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And it seems that the continual theme in this scripture is that obedience is what pleases the Lord. But let us remember that throughout the centuries, we did not walk in blind obedience, no. But we have a sense of understanding through faith uh, to know what has happened in the past and the prophecies, and it shows us that we can trust God. So our obedience is based on faith, and like water is drawn from a living well of water by the Holy Spirit, we can confidently say, yes, Lord, and be in obedience to the Lord, because we know that the Lord has a plan and a purpose for our lives, and we know that his will for us is good. Have you ever had somebody pray? They just seem to be at the end of the rope, and finally they're gonna pray, okay, Lord, your will be done. It's like, hey, hey, guys, God's will for us is good. Pray for that first. His will for us is good. We've got to get that in our minds because we're asking God for something. We're asking and, and we're saying, okay, well, finally, we're going to stop telling God what to do and say, okay, I'll accept your will. Well, maybe that we don't know what his will is in that sense, except we know it is good for us. So because he has a plan and a purpose for our life, and he's reserved a future of hope for us, okay? So we were reminded at Mass recently by Father Michael about rituals, that they are not proof of holiness. We, you might know someone who says, well, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to go to Mass, and I'm going to go to confession, and I'm, uh, you know, how and I'm going to go to Holy Communion, and I'm going to pray my rosary, and I'm going to do this. Well, that is not proof of holiness. That's not what makes you holy. God has set you apart. You are a royal priesthood, a holy people set apart by God to, to bring others out of darkness into his wonderful light as you have been. So I liked that reminder of Father Michael that rituals are not proof of holiness. We must know Jesus as Lord and enter into a relationship with him and be filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to walk in obedience to him and to be a light in the world. There are some I, thoughts that I had, uh, so just a review of the fulfillment of the prophecies. Uh, the first one, these are the significant symbols and fulfillment of prophecies. First of all, the Messiah was prophesied to be born of a virgin. And so he was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So who was the ark and temple for the Messiah? In the flesh. She gave Jesus flesh. So our own Messiah was Jesus, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The third is Jesus was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The fourth is our Messiah was born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, which means house of bread. It was prophesied that he would be born in the city of David, and Bethlehem becomes the new paradise and heaven, which will now be opened with the birth of the Christ, who is Jesus. That was from the ancient Christian commentary. Now, Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. We know that. Swaddling clothes bound a baby. And I used to be fascinated at my friend Nancy because she would take her grandbabies, and I've seen Marilyn do this too, they lay them on the little baby blanket and they wrap them this way and wrap them this way and wrap them up, and they're so tight they can't move them, just there. Well, those are swaddling clothes. <laughs> and, and the babies wrapped in swaddling clothes, Jesus was bound as a baby. Can you imagine? Here it is, God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And, but this kept the baby from moving. And this is a symbol of Jesus taking on the bondage of flesh by becoming man. And Jesus would one day break the bondages of, by his death and resurrection, the bondages that we have. Though he was rich and Lord of heaven and earth, he became poor to teach us that by being poor in spirit, humble, that we might... Uh, even the kingdom of enter the kingdom of heaven through our faith in him. And finally, Jesus, our Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords, was laid in a manger. The manger is the trough where the food for the animals was put. And so the symbol of truth is that he would become the bread of life for us. He said, I am the living bread come down from heaven. So when they came to the temple, Mary and Joseph brought baby Jesus they encountered Simeon. And it was interesting because the scripture says in verse 26, it had been revealed to Simeon that he would not see death 
until he set eyes on the Christ of the Lord. And so he was prompted by the Holy Spirit that day and came to the temple. He hadn't intended to go that day, but the Holy Spirit took him there. So when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the law required, he took him into his arms and he blessed God and he said, Now, Master, you can let your servant go in peace just as you promised because mine eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared for all the nations to see, a light to enlighten the pagans and the glory of your people, Israel. I think it's kind of interesting this form of prayer, uh, a canticle is what I called it, the, the Magnificat of the Blessed Virgin Mary we had, where she personally praised the Lord for what he had done for her. The Benedictus of Zechariah, where it was a prophetic prayer that God had given to him after he hadn't been able to speak for nine months. And then this canticle of Simeon, which is a, a prophetic prayer of thanksgiving and praise. And so... Anna praises also and encourages others to believe in Jesus. And um, so anyway, I, I love that, that prayer of his. He, he was, everybody knows that. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So um, anyway, that, now we're going to take a look at um, a road trip. Everybody likes a road trip, right? <laughs> We're going to end this lesson with Jesus' family in a, on a trip to Jerusalem for the Passover. So once a, once a male was 12 years old, he was expected to go to Jerusalem for these, these days at least. The Passover, the Pentecost, and the harvest, uh, the festival of harvest, which was called the Tabernacles. So when Mary and Joseph, after three days, realized that Jesus was not in the family's traveling party. They, they had a caravan, and, and the commentary is saying, generally the women traveled with the women, the men traveled with uh, the men, the boys traveled with the, and the family members could get mixed up, but um, it, children could travel with whomever. So they probably, when they found uh, out that Jesus was missing, they, I'm sure, were in a panic. Have you ever lost your child in Target <laughs> or Legoland or Disneyland or anything? It's like, where is he? Uh, it's terrifying. And so when Mary and Joseph, after three days, realized that Jesus was not in the Aegis party, they, they were in a panic. And so they went back to Jerusalem. Now this is what's really interesting for me, just this thought that Mary and Joseph, Joseph began to look for Jesus. They began to search for him. Well, what efforts do we make in our search for Jesus? He says, seek and you will find. And the one who seeks will find. And that's what we need to do. We need to continually seek the presence of Jesus in our lives so that we can be present with him and he with us. So um, they went back to Jerusalem. They found him in the temple. And so we hear the fifth joyful mystery, the finding of Jesus in the temple. I'd like to share with you just a little story. Uh, I mean, you know how you do the rosary and you have the annunciation, the visitation, the nativity, and you know, yada, yada. Okay, so we got to the, I, I was coming in, and it had to be a Monday morning because that's when here at St. Elizabeth Seton we pray the joyful mysteries. So I opened the door and I went to sit down, and they were announcing this mystery the finding of Jesus in the temple. I was so astounded, I wanted to cry. The finding of Jesus in the temple. I thought immediately, wow, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. Am I going to find Jesus in my temple? I need to seek him in a deeper way and find him. So every time I pray that, that mystery anymore, it's like, oh Lord, I want to find you. I want to find you in a new way. Um, so. Invite the Lord. Just say, Lord, let me find you in, in this temple. Well, what was Jesus' reply to his parents at 12 years old? Even though Mary <coughs> knew who he was, she said, why have you done this to us? Now, she might have said it really, really nice. She was the Blessed Virgin Mary. <laughs> but why have you done to this, this to a son? But it had nothing to do with them. But it had everything to do with his life's work. Mm -hmm. He was born to save. And so he said, did you not know I must be about my father's business? 
didn't you know? She knew. And yet, in that flesh, she was saying, where is my son? Well, those are the first recorded words of Jesus, the Messiah. Did you not know? I must be about my father's business. That was our Lord and Savior, Jesus. I've often thought we also need to do what Jesus did. We need to be about the Father's business in obedience. Not just say what he said, but do what Jesus did. And this is a great example. We must be about our Father's business. We must tell the good news. We must cure the sick. We must heal the lame. We must set the captives free and tell everyone that God loves him so much that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. We need to have a way to be reconciled to the Father. And we have that way. We know it. We need to share that with others. It is also our work. You have been chosen by God to hear this message, and so let us challenge ourselves to pass it on. Amen. So, Father, thank you for your word given to us today. Thank you for your life. You, you gave up everything. You gave up heaven and came to earth as a baby, wrapped up tight so you couldn't even move, and yet you humbled yourself. You humbled yourself on the cross for our sakes. And so we thank you, Jesus, for your love. Allow your word to take root into our hearts. We pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.